lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. Welcome, brothers and sisters. I'm Father Al Lauer. Glad to share the Word of God with you. We're in the middle of this whole series on brotherhood and sisterhood. Even if you missed the beginning, don't worry. Just keep on uh, listening. We talked about brotherhood and sisterhood in the Old Testament. We just gave a few little uh, lowlights, I guess. And then we talked about brotherhood and sisterhood in the uh, New Testament, beginning with the Gospels, and we got with the rest of the New Testament. Then we started getting into church history and the church fathers and just gave a few uh, things about what the church fathers said about the church, the church of the body of Christ, the church is one, and what does that mean for brotherhood and sisterhood. And we talked about martyrdom. And when you saw this scene, those people, remember when these people were being killed, it wasn't just this person being killed and then the person killing them. There were people around a lot of times, Christians, brothers and sisters, screaming, saying, praise the Lord, God is great, washed in the blood and stuff like that. And you look at these people cheering while their brothers and sisters are being martyred, and you just say, what's going on with these people? What do these people believe? What kind of bond of unity do these people have with each other and with the Lord? Well, we mentioned that a little bit. And we also talked about the, what about the people who didn't, uh, get martyred and didn't just cheer the, the, the people on. What about the apostates? What about people who committed serious sins? Uh, brotherhood and sisterhood took precedence over the worst sins. Uh, and uh, the people were brought back into the community if they repented and were willing to come back into the community. Well, anyway, that's kind of where we are, but we're going to pick up from there. We're getting into the round of years 300 to Constantine. Augustine, and uh, we'll by the time we'll get to the year 2000, uh, we'll skip a few things, as you probably guess. We won't get to the 2000 in this program, but three, three more programs down the road, we'll be at 2000. We're close. Anyway, let's pray. Lord, we just pray that we would just be able to see certain things that have happened over the centuries, the movements of the Spirit, and this would teach us, this would restore us to brotherhood and sisterhood. Give us the mind and hearts of brothers and sisters. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to bless you. Remember, we've been baptized into one body, into a brotherhood and a sisterhood that is in a class by itself. Praise the Lord. Okay, now we went through the first couple hundred years, martyrs and, and apostates and formation of the church. Now we get to the, to the 300s. And uh, I'm going to get into something from St. Augustine. Uh, Augustine said uh, there were people, even in those days, who were breaking off from the church. It was the Protestant Reformation, only early, early parts, and, and didn't quite get to be such a big break. And so these Protestant uh, reformers, not the 1500 A.D. Protestant reformers, but the 300 A.D. reformers, uh, they um, said, we are not brothers and sisters with you people anymore. We have broken off now, and uh, we are going to uh, baptize you again uh, if you join us, because that first baptism didn't count. And, and then some people said, well, if, if uh, these people uh, join us after they were baptized in this group that's broken off from, our, from, from the body of Christ, well, we have to baptize them over again, don't we? And Augustine said, no, no, no. This whole concept about do you have to get rebaptized if you were baptized by an uh, apostate group? 
Uh, okay, what's the, here, here we go. It says, Brothers, we exhort you most of all to show this charity not only toward one another, but also to those who are outside our communion. So even if we're not in communion, we're still brothers and sisters. Even if a person ran away from home, he's still your brother and your sister, brother or your sister. Whether they be pagans who do not know Christ or Christians separated from the body, let us grieve for them, brethren, as though for our own brothers. They are our brothers, whether they wish to be or not. They will only cease to be our brothers when they will have ceased to say our Father. Let them say, why do you seek us? Why do you want us? We will answer, you are our brothers. Let them say, go away. We have nothing in common with you. We absolutely do have something in common. We profess one Christ. We ought to be united in one body under one head. I therefore entreat you, brethren, brothers and sisters, through the very depth of that love by whose milk we are nourished and by whose bread we are fortified, I entreat you through our Lord Jesus Christ and through his meekness. It is now time that we employ such a great charity in their regard and overflowing mercy. And so he says, you are brothers and sisters with us because we share the one Lord. And even if you are not in communion with us, we all say our Father, we're brothers and sisters, and that should take precedence. Sad to say, that did not take precedence many times in history, and then we have the Protestant Reformation. We, uh, we're still brothers and sisters with, between Protestants and Catholics, but um, we're not acting like it. We're not living like it. And um, so our, our doctrinal disagreements have taken precedence over our brotherhood and sister. We should have stayed in the same church and just fought with each other. <laughs> Sounds terrible, but, but we, um, we would we'd still be together. You know, you, you see what I mean. We, we should say, well, even if I think you're all wrong, I have to stay here and be your brother and tell you you're all wrong, not just get out of here and say, I don't have nothing to do with you people. Well, you say, well, it says in 1 Corinthians 5, if a brother's immoral, get out of there. But see, doctrinal differences are not necessarily indications of immorality. And, of course, just because one brother is immoral, that doesn't mean you leave the whole church. That probably the whole church is not immoral. Uh, so so you, you get the idea. Uh, this, this whole thing about we don't rebaptize people because when you get baptized into Christ, you're, you're a brother and sister a brother or sister of us, whether you uh, know it, whether you recognize it, whether we recognize it, it's an ontological thing. It's a fact. It is a fact that we just need to acknowledge whether we like it or not. So this really says something about brotherhood and sister. Brotherhood and sister is not just a feeling. Brotherhood and sister is not just something we, um, we might be interested in. It's something we're in whether we like it or not. Once we got baptized into it, we're in it. We can't change it. We can't get unbrothered or unsistered. We can ignore it, but ignoring reality is not right. It's not good for people. So I think you kind of understand. We hope you do. Okay, let's uh, get on this on with this a little bit more. Um, Co Constantine, the Roman emperor, after years of the Romans persecuting Christians, he had this very amazing experience in um, uh, about 312, uh, he had this uh, vision where he saw him conquering with the key row, which is something like an X and a P, but it's key row, two letters of the Greek alphabet, which represent Christ, which is abbreviation for the name Christ. And he put that on his shoulder, uh, on his sh uh, shields of his army, and uh, they won this fantastic battle under um, impossible circumstances at the Milvian Bridge near Rome. And he said that Christ did that. I don't know who Christ is, but he's the one who did that victory for me. So then in 313, he passed the Edict of Milan. And then there was um, agreement to, um, to accept Christianity. Well, it wasn't uh, too much later than that that um, you were, um, uh, you had to be a Christian, to be in the army of all things. And uh, Christianity was kind of the favorite religion. 
And, uh, you know, in one way you say, hey, that's, that's really great. In 381, the Emperor Theodosius uh, made Christianity the only, the only um, official religion. Now, so if you wanted to get ahead in politics, you wanted to get a good job, you wanted to make money, you needed to be a Christian. Now, it was, it was great that the uh, government wanted to promote Christianity, but see, that opened the door for a lot of people getting in there who weren't really converted, who, wanted to, who knew that this was the social thing to do, this was the politically correct thing to do. Was, isn't that ironic that uh, Christianity that is so unpolitically correct now <laughs> all of a sudden became, <laughs> became uh, politically correct? many years ago and uh, or we just had tons of people join in the church who were uh, just kind of in it for social political economic reasons and, and then the whole the whole faith the whole commitment to the Lord was just you know kind of messed up and, and then of course the brotherhood and sisterhood was messed up now now brotherhood and sisterhood was it was not such a special thing it was just the way everybody was. It got watered down to mean almost nothing. And I think we've never really recovered from that. Uh, for the last 1,600 years, we have just been going on with brotherhood, sisterhood, really Christianity, relationship with Christ, the whole gospel and everything being so watered down that it just really doesn't mean anything. So people, you know, just say, everybody's my brother and my sister. You know, whether you're baptized or not, big deal. Whether you believe in Jesus, big deal. Whether you believe in... Jesus is a God, well, big deal. We're just all brothers and sisters in this world or something like that. And, and so the whole thing has really got watered down. And, and then uh, uh, some, of, some people realized that, and they just said Christianity has been uh, ruined by being uh, uh, kind of funded, uh, uh, endowed, giving, given a lot of material benefits. And so they felt the call of the Holy Spirit to go out into the desert and be monks. Now, the word monk comes from the, the word, I guess it's Greek and Latin, monos, meaning uh, alone. Now, you might say, well, these people go off alone into the desert. That's not really promoting brotherhood and sisterhood, I guess, except in a roundabout way that they're promoting a, a more uh, really sacrificial Christianity which with a better relationship with the Lord, then we could restore uh, the real meaning of Christianity and therefore the real meaning of brotherhood and sisterhood. So in a roundabout way, the monks were helping brotherhood and sisterhood. Yes, but more than in a roundabout way, they were uh, promoting brotherhood and sisterhood, even though they were alone in one sense of the word, alone certainly in contradistinction to the world. But uh, they, m many of these monks started getting inspired by the Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that sent them out into the desert. That Spirit was sending them uh, into some sort of Christian community. And so these monks started forming community. And um, this is a quote from Alfred, uh, well, it's a quote from Edward Gibbon, the famous English historian. And he says, a single Benedictine monastery. Now, the Benedictines came, you know, another couple hundred years down the road, but they, they were uh, kind of, um, you know, inspired by the early monks. And it says, a single Benedictine monastery may have done more for the cause of knowledge than Oxford and Cambridge combined. The brotherhood and sisterhood there was so strong that it uh, overcame what might be called the Dark Ages, if you believe in the Dark Ages. It was, it was so strong it overcame the Babel, barbarian invasions. It was so strong it, it overcame the, I guess you'd say, destruction of, of civilization in some way. It was so strong that, according to Edward Gibbon, it, it did more for, um, for people, for society, for relationships, for the way the world is. It did more than Oxford and Cambridge, two very prestigious institutions combined. Uh, so, um, so this is a, a great movement of the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, if I'm not a monk or a Benedictine or somebody out in the desert, this doesn't have anything to do with me. These monks and Benedictines, 
these people were not telling, saying, this is the way a few people live, the rest of you, you just be pagans. No, they were modeling brotherhood and sisterhood. They, not everyone's called to live it in the, in the exact details of these church fathers, excuse me, of these desert fathers, these desert monks, these uh, Benedictines, but everyone was called to live it, live brotherhood and sisterhood. And you see the modeling of brotherhood and sisterhood, and you also see the triumph of brotherhood and sisterhood over the worst conditions. Uh, you can see this, for example, in Japan with the with these small communities that that uh, lasted for, for the 400 years of, of Westerners and, and Christians being expelled from Japan. And, um, and you can see it with Russia. And you can see the, uh, how communism just kind of came and went. But the brothers and sisters in the underground church in Russia can, you know, lasted and overcame. So the power of brotherhood and sisterhood is not just the power of church coins, not just the power of saying prayers. Well, sure, there's great power in prayer, but, but we're not talking about that. It's not just the power of uh, being a good Christian and stuff. Uh, there's a lot of, you need more than that. You need not just pieces of Christianity, you need to get it all together, and it comes together in brotherhood and in sisterhood. Okay, well, let's move on a little bit. Uh, f after we talk about the... Um, the monks were, were up to, with the Benedictines, maybe maybe 500 or so. And I did mention the Dark Ages. Uh, and uh, there's kind of questions about how dark were the Dark Ages and all that. And I won't get into all that. But let's really take a big jump forward and go to around the year 1000 or shortly before that. The East and the West, meaning uh, the East would be like Russia and, and um, Turkey and Greece and these type of areas. Uh, the east and west, west would be mostly Europe, you know, split. Uh, and then we had what is called the Orthodox Church or Eastern Orthodox Church. Now this was, you know, a catastrophe for brotherhood and sisterhood. It was kind of like, you're still my brother, just like St. Augustine said, we talked about that earlier. And you're still my sister, but I don't see you. You don't see me. We don't relate to each other. Well, what kind of brotherhood and sisterhood is that? It's, it's, it's real. It really happened, but we're not living it. We're refusing to, to acknowledge it. We're not giving it any priority. We're giving our doctrinal differences, or usually more than that, political differences, or just uh, a, a personality differences. We're, giving, we're putting that and giving that precedence over brotherhood and sisterhood. So that break between the East and West was, was an absolute catastrophe. And Pope John Paul II, some people say that, I don't know if this is true, but this is what I read, said that if he uh, finishes his papacy, and we don't know how long it'll last, but um, you know he's not going to go for another 20 years probably, um, it, without the East and West united, he would consider his uh, papal ministry a failure. And so, um, like this, in Good Friday of 1995, he had a, 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 a I think, a Russian Orthodox priest, uh, maybe it was Eastern Orthodox or Russian Orthodox, uh, helped carry the cross for the Good Friday uh, liturgy of the Passion and the prayers that go along with that. And uh, this was really a, a great uh, honor and it is a statement about we're, we really got to deal with that. It's about a thousand years old. The Pope has said, wouldn't it be astounding, wouldn't it be wonderful if by the year 2000 we would work out the problem that occurred around the year 1000. So this was an absolute catastrophe for brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, if you kind of look at this, you, you can kind of see, um, well, Christopher Dawson, a famous church historian, said there was like seven ages of the church and and he just lists them in kind of a regular curves. There's this great, great uh, movement of the, of the Holy Spirit, and then things kind of go down. And then there's another great movement, and then things go down. And he just sees seven of these, these major fluctuations. Well, uh, I don't know about all that, but Christopher Dawson knows uh, more in his little finger than about church history than, than I know my whole, my whole life, my whole body. 
So maybe you know he may he may well be right. Uh, he's certainly a great great uh, um, teacher, especially in church history. But uh, we can kind of see this pattern, even though I don't know if I can see it exactly as clearly as Christopher Dawson sees it. You know, the Old Testament was just a catastrophe for brotherhood and sisterhood. And all we had were glimmers of hope, and then we you know have the New Testament and Pentecost, and wow. Brotherhood and sisterhood, it really happened. Jesus started choosing brothers, to four brothers to start off his 12 apostles. Boy, you know, that tells you something right there. And, uh, uh, but then, you know, then we, we see some, some great things happening with brothers and sisters, but uh, with the martyrdom, but then we see apostasy, which is just the, the breakdown of brotherhood and sisterhood. And, uh, you know, we, we, we're seeing a lot of ups and downs. And then, you know, with Constantine coming and kind of flooding the church with a bunch of unconverted people, wow, it just turned out to be a mess. Of course, it was flooded with some converted people, too. But then the monks come forth, and then, then things go bad with the Dark Ages, and then this super catastrophe, the split between the East and West. But then then we see a great movement. Some people call that, uh, like, I guess maybe the 1200s, 1300s, Right around there with the uh, the mendicants uh, orders. Uh, here we have the uh, the Franciscans and the Dominicans. These uh, these beggar orders. That's what mendicants mean. And a great movement once again of brotherhood and sisterhood. Not just brother and sister for very specialized people, but but for everybody. You know the third order of Saint Francis, which is now called secular Franciscans, which were mostly almost all lay people, there was so many people in that, so many people living brotherhood and sisterhood. And one of the things that, that they would say would be that you would never take up arms if you were in the third order. Well, there were so many people in that. And there were so many people putting a priority of brotherhood and sisterhood over anything else that they had, couldn't have wars in Europe after having them for hundreds of years. Because they didn't have enough people to do the wars because Seemed like everybody was a third order Franciscan and was putting brotherhood and sisterhood over everything else, over the, the differences between the city states and all these uh, vengeful things that, that uh, have been happening for centuries. Uh, but, but you see these mendicant orders, they call themselves the little brothers of penance, friars, which is a variation, I hope I get this right, a frater, meaning brother. And so brotherhood and sisterhood took precedence over everything else. And wow, then we had the gold, golden age of Christianity. At least some people see it, see it that way. So a terrible thing happens. God does a great work. Or maybe you can look at, around, look at the other way. A great thing happens. The devil does, tries to react. God just keeps on doing one fantastic thing after the other. Well, then... Uh, Maybe we could look at the, um, this is really jumping ahead, but, but um, there's a basis for this. Looking at the social teaching of the church, which of course has been ever since the, um, you know, the New Testament times, even Old Testament times. But I think most people would say in the last hundred years, there's been a tremendous uh, movement of the spirit in the teachings of the church regarding social justice, just astounding works of the Holy Spirit. Now you might say, wait a minute, you're jumping from, from 1300 to 1900. Well, uh, we, we already mentioned the Protestants and Catholic split, which was you know, catastrophic. It's something like the East and West. That was around the 1500s. And so uh, after the 1300s and the re the great golden age of Christianity. Uh, then we have the, the tremendous breakdown of Pro that Protestant Catholic uh, uh, split cause. And then after that, things really went bad, really went bad. You say, gee, what, how worse? Well, we had the Council of Trent, which was a great renewal. And then we had the Jesuits and some renewal orders and things. So great, once again, the a modeling of brotherhood and sisterhood and restoration of brotherhood and sisterhood. But you know, then we have the Enlightenment, which was very unenlightening. If you think the Dark Ages were dark, you ought to see how dark the Enlightenment was. 
say, how could the enlightenment be dark? Isn't, wouldn't it kind of lose its name? But it was, it was darkness. And then we had the Industrial Revolution, which, which all kind of goes back to uh, pro, uh, Protestantism and um, enlightenment. Things that happened there made it possible to, um, to have uh, the developments that we call the Industrial Revolution. And uh, this is starting to affect people's whole way of looking at life, affecting jobs, the way they relate it to their everyday use of their, of their abilities. Uh, eventually, communism came out of this, and tremendous uh, poverty and uh, capitalism and uh, unions. And, and basically, the teaching of the church over this last century that was really trying to deal with something that had been developing over several centuries was solidarity, brotherhood and sisterhood, taking precedence over making money, uh, and, and also the human person taking precedence over making money. Uh, Pope Leo XIII, uh, Rerum Novarum, Pacem and Terris, John XXIII, Progressio Popularum, Paul VI, Solicitude Rei Socialis, uh, Centesimus Annus, uh, Pope John Paul II. Great movement of the Holy Spirit. And, and it's a movement back to brotherhood and sisterhood. Let's pray. Lord, may we just let the Spirit take us back and teach us brotherhood and sisterhood all over again historically and for the first time for us personally, for so many of us. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Your hands in praise Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days He is the light that shines in the darkness He is the rock that stands Glory and honor